Okay. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, John Horgan here on the traditional territory of the Lekongan speaking people, the Esquimalt and Songhees First Nation. And I'm joined here today by Minister Melanie Mark and Jonathan Burke, the board chair of the H.R. McMillan Space Centre. As we all know, the days are getting warmer and a little bit longer, and over 55% of eligible British Columbians have received their first vaccine. Now, while we still need to bear down against the pandemic, all signs are pointing to positive days ahead this coming summer. We have challenges to be sure, but we need to focus for the next number of days on following rules, making sure we're not traveling unnecessarily and hoping for a better future uh, coming after the May long weekend. Everybody in BC, of course, has fond memories of visiting and working at BC's major tourism attractions. From museums to amusement parks to science centers, these sites are part of BC's world-renowned tourism industry. And right now, people in tourism are hurting. In fact, few sectors have been hit as hard by COVID-19 as the tourism sector. Many of our major tourism attractions, as we all know and love, are struggling, and we need to make sure we're there for them. The effects, of course, are far-reaching, not just on those anchor attractions, but to the many communities that depend on tourism landmarks to have people coming through their community to boost the local economy and bring visitors to town. They provide many young people with their first jobs. I worked on the uh, Coho Ferry, a tourism operation from Port Angeles to Victoria when I was in high school, telling people how to get to Butchart Gardens when they came off the ferry. And I'm not alone. Many, many other British Columbians had the same experience, their first job, and also an introduction to how important it is to welcome back visitors to our province. But not just yet. It's not far off, but we need to stay vigilant and we need to be mindful that our international borders remain closed and there are public health orders in place to restrict non-essential travel. It's critically important to our well-being that we do so. But we also need to now start to focus on what we do coming out of the pandemic and how can we help businesses not just survive, but to recover strongly as we come out of the COVID-19 pandemic. Today, we're launching a new program to support BC's tourism landmarks. The new BC Major Anchor Attractions Program will provide a total of up to $50 million to sites right across British Columbia. And that will in include, of course, tour bus operators who will be eligible because they bring people to many of these attractions day after day, month after month, year after year. This is, of course, a grant, not a loan, and that means it can be used for a number of things to offset fixed costs like payroll, rent, utilities, and other costs that have been accrued over the past number of months. All of this with the goal of making it easier to restart and ramp up operations when it's safe to do so. There's more to do to support tourism, to be sure, but this is a critically important first step. It helps us to fill the gaps that were identified by the Tourism Task Force, which was put together at the request of the industry. Overall, it supports midterm recovery and long-term resilience for the tourism industry. We all want to enjoy the iconic attractions that make British Columbia so special. And I'm going to ask Minister Melanie Mark now to share some of those details with you as we prepare to welcome the world back to British Columbia again when it's safe to do so. Over to you, Mel. Thank you, Premier. Simgaget, Sigatamanak, Gibit Wiltsik. Hi, everyone. My name is Melanie Mark. My Niska name is Lahai Kwiskak, and I'm very proud to be BC's Minister for Tourism, Arts, Culture, and Sport. I'm also the first and only First Nations woman to get elected in BC and to serve in BC's cabinet. I'm proud to be Niska, Gitsan, Cree, and Ojibwe, and I'd like to acknowledge the traditional territory of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh First Nations whose territory we're coming to you from. Thank you for joining us from all parts of the province to hear about further supports for the tourism sector. As the Premier said, the COVID-19 pandemic has had devastating and long-term impacts on tourism businesses. From small businesses trying to stay open safely and keep people working to rent payments and cash flow for large organizations, we know the hardships people in the tourism industry continue to face. 
Throughout the pandemic, our government has worked with tourism leaders to listen to their feedback and provide additional supports. Major anchor attractions and tour bus companies have faced unique challenges across our tourism ecosystem. They play a vital role in our economy. They are key employers in local communities. Businesses across the province rely on anchor attractions to draw visitors to communities, to visit the gift shops, the restaurants, and other attractions in the area. Tour bus companies are vital to make the, these regional destinations and experiences accessible for travelers. Today's announcement means we're taking action to ensure these important institutions can continue to create jobs, contribute to local culture, and draw people back to BC once it's safe to do so. Many major attractions, anchor attractions and tour bus operators continue to face significant liquidity challenges. The loss of these organizations would undermine the tourism industry's short-term recovery prospects and significantly impact jobs in the tourism sector. There is up to $50 million in supports, as the Premier mentioned, through the BC Major Anchor Attractions Program, major anchor attractions and urban centres that receive 75,000 or more visitors per year are eligible up to $1 million. Major anchor attractions in rural areas that receive 15,000 or more visitors per year and tour bus companies that serve 30,000 or more passengers per year are both el eligible for up to 500,000. Supporting anchor attractions and tour bus companies will help maintain vitally important tourism infrastructure. It also has a strong ripple effect as the, as the Premier mentioned on our youth. Many tourism attractions provide invaluable work experience, job and life skills training for young people. And in some cases help students pay for their post-secondary education. The bottom line is people are our economy and when people are working, our economy works. Starting today, the province will be accepting applications from anchor attractions and tour bus companies throughout BC. As the premier said, these are grants, not loans. It's a very, very exciting day for the industry. The application window will be open until Monday, June 7th with funds provided by July, 2021. I strongly encourage organizations to apply because we want these supports to help major anchor attractions and tour bus companies weather the impacts of COVID-19. Now, so that BC remains a globally competitive destination of choice in the long term when we safely invite visitors back to our beautiful province. With almost 60% of eligible British Columbians vaccinated, there is reason to be hopeful. Together, we are going to make progress. And on that note, I would like to introduce Jonathan Burke, board chair of the HR McMillan Space Center in Vancouver. He will share the experiences those in the tourism, sec tourism sector face today and how these supports will help. Thank you. Over to you, Jonathan. Thank you very much, uh, Minister Mark and, and Premier Horgan. Uh, I'm very uh, happy to be part of this announcement. It's very exciting for our organization to give you some context of what happened to the Space Center uh, due to COVID. Uh, we employ approximately 50 people here in Vancouver at the at the Space Center. Uh, we had to lay off over half of our employees at the beginning of, uh, of COVID-19. We've, we've been slowly drawing people back through wage supports and other programs. Uh, and our board and our management team immediately focused on three priorities. First, survive as an organization. Second, working on resetting our organization. We went to a lot of online program. We tried to, to develop whatever programming we could that could uh, get out to an audience uh, that didn't involve on-site visits. But to give you some context of what happened to our on-site attendance, in 2019, we had almost 143,000 people move through the gates at the HR McMillan uh, Space Center. Uh, that went to 33,000 in 2020 almost a 76% decline. So you can imagine what happened to our revenues. We went from almost 1.2 million in revenues to 270,000 in revenues from gate admissions, a 78% decline in revenue, which was very dramatic. And it was very, very difficult to deal with, with what happened. In addition, we also provide a lot of educational programs at the HR McMillan Space Center to school-aged children. And our 2020 attendance uh, declined 
almost 80% for school-aged children visiting our site. So it was, it was a dramatic impact. We're now focusing on getting ready for when the pandemic is what we might call over. If it, uh, and that is part of our survive, reset, and now thrive. And these funds from the government will really contribute towards our ability to thrive as an organization as we emerge from the pandemic to prepare for, for guests to come back, for all of the associated activities that happen on our beautiful location. And uh, this is just a, a wonderful day and a wonderful announcement, and I thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Jonathan, uh, for telling us the story of H.R. McMillan, and thank you, Mel, for laying out the details of uh, this exciting opportunity for the major tourism attractions here in British Columbia. And with that, I'll ask uh, uh, the media to pose their questions through Lindsay. Thank you. As a reminder to everybody on the phone line, please press star 1 to enter the queue. You are limited to one question and one follow-up. First question today is from Binder Sajjan, CTV. Uh, hi. I'm just wondering how many of these uh, tourist uh, attractions and uh, tour bus operators do you expect will be eligible to apply? And on average, how much funding could they expect to receive? Go ahead, Mel. Thank you. So for for companies that have over 150 employees, uh, they will be eligible to up to $1 million. For the tour companies and the rural attractions, they will be up to $500,000. There are less than a dozen uh, tour bus companies that we're aware of. Uh, with the rural, we've got different uh, attractions across the province. So we're really trying to make this $50 million stretch across the area codes uh, to support anchor attractions that are immovable, as, as the Premier mentioned, uh, the landmarks in our communities. And, and so we're, our, our job right now is to try to get the money out the door today, get, get people applying today. Binder, do you have a follow-up? Yes, um, and I know that you're speaking about um, businesses that have 150 employees or more, but there are a number of uh, businesses that have quite a lot less. Um, and they're worried because the wage subsidy and rent relief is being phased out. So they're asking for a reopening plan. Um, and, you know, other provinces, you know, have reopening plans that relate to case numbers. And just wondering, Premier, if you can tell us, you know, whether you are a small operator that has only maybe one employee or if you are planning uh, events in the industry, is BC going to be announcing that as part of a reopening plan? Well, thanks for the question. And we have, of course, been providing small and medium-sized businesses with grants uh, for some time now. We uh, revised the program to add an additional top-up for the tourism sector because of the challenges it's faced, mostly those small operators that you, you identified. We'll be talking, Dr. Henry and Minister Dix and I will uh, be having a press conference next week uh, to talk about the future, a talk about where we're going from here, and we'll have more details at that time. But I want to stress for people that we set the May long weekend as a target for the circuit breaker because we need to make sure we reduce cases, we see hospitalizations go down, and we increase our vaccinations. We're right on track, but we're not out of the woods yet. And I don't want to give false hope until we get through the weekend and we look at the data, and then we'll be laying all that out very clearly for the public at that time. Next question is from Keith Baldry, Global News. <clears throat> Hi, uh, Premier and Minister Mark. I'm just wondering about the P&E. They're looking for $8 million. And this program, would, if they qualify, I assume they would, would max out their, their funding grant at $1 million. Uh, is there another mechanism that your government's looking at to enable the P&E to survive beyond this? Well, certainly it's uh, attractions like the P&E, not-for-profits, that we had in mind when we developed the program. Uh, and I know that the P&E has other options through the City of Vancouver, primarily. Uh, and we're going to continue to work with both the City and the P&E and, of course, other attractions across the province. But this was designed for the P&E to make the application. I look forward to seeing that material when it comes forward. I know, Keith, uh, the P&E has a particular spot in your heart uh, from your time, uh, like me, working in the tourism sector as a kid. Keith, do you have a follow-up? Yeah, just is any more detail beyond that? I mean, so are you ruling out giving the P&E more money or is there an option for the P&E to qualify for further funding beyond this particular program? 
when the PE applies for this program, we'll have a better understanding of the challenges that they face and we'll work with stakeholders across the piece who have a, a vested interest in the success at Playland and the PE uh, to make sure that it can go forward. But uh, we have a whole bunch of attractions across the province that have been waiting for this announcement and I know they're all going to be excited about it and I'm sure the PE will be as well. Rob Shaw, Czech News. Oh, hi, uh, Premier. Wondering if you could list some island attractions that uh, you think are eligible here, like Boutard Gardens. I know you've mentioned in the past the Royal BC Museum, which is technically, I guess, a crown corporation. Are there major island attractions that uh, qualify here? And also, uh, just on the application deadline, June 7th, I think is 20 days. It seems kind of tight given how these programs require paperwork and that type of thing. So what do you make of that? Well, on the, on the timeline, Rob, we've been working uh, step by step with the major attractions to put this program in place. So there's no surprises here. You'll see from uh, Jonathan's uh, uh, contribution from H.R. McMillan and others who have made comments uh, as part of this announcement that the industry and the sector uh, was waiting for this. They've helped develop this. So I don't believe there are going to be many bumps along that road. Uh, certainly, Butchart Gardens is the one that springs to mind here on the island. Uh, but uh, tourism, or, or pardon me, uh, tourist bus operators as well will be able to access this resource. And that's critically important. Uh, we want to, of course, make sure we get as many people to attractions as possible. And the best way to do that is on a tour bus. Rob, do you have a follow up? <clears throat> sure, thanks. Uh, also, Premier, on, on the tourism issue, I uh, would want to know um, what you may or may not personally be doing about the cruise ship legislation that has passed so far in the United States. Are you meeting with the Alaskan delegation? Are you doing anything kind of personally with the Prime Minister or others on this spot? Yeah, we, I received correspondence from Senators Sullivan and Murkowski uh, when they were bringing the legislation forward. They made it clear in that correspondence that this was going to be a temporary measure until such time as border restrictions were lifted. Uh, so I'm taking great comfort in that. The legislation is specific about that. I have talked to the federal government about borders and how we're going to respond, not just to uh, the cruise sector, but in fact, uh, the entire world. And those decisions and discussions are ongoing. Uh, but I will say that the notion of technical stops at British Columbia ports, if that will assist the industry to uh, be maintained, we're happy to talk about that. But the, before there's a cruise ship going up and down the west coast of North America, the U.S. Center for Disease Control has to approve that. The federal government will have something to say about that as well. From my perspective, as the head of a subnational government that has a long coast that welcomes the world and welcomes uh, tour ships by the many, many hundreds uh, with uh, literally hundreds of thousands of passengers, we want to see that come back. We want to see that come back strongly, but it's not going to happen in the next number of weeks. Uh, and at, at, at this point, it's not going to happen until next season. But uh, with vaccinations going as well as they are, uh, with case counts and hospitalizations going down here in British Columbia at, at any event, we're feeling confident, but it's not just about BC, it's about North America, it's about the world. And we have to gauge with our federal partners what's happening elsewhere before we uh, open the doors to uh, people from somewhere else. Next question is from Katie DeRosa, Vancouver Sun. Hi, Premier. I'm just wondering to, uh, to what extent is the province actually consulting with uh, tourism operators in the tourism industry on the restart plan because, again, many of them are asking to be included and asking for that roadmap um, so that they can plan for the summer. So what level of involvement do they have on the reopening? Well, it's been significant, and I'll pass it to Mel to, to talk about the details, but we have from the beginning been working with industries, not-for-profits, labour, communities to make sure that we're all on the same page. And I believe the success we've had in British Columbia, although there have been bumps along the way, relative to other jurisdictions is a direct result of the communication that we've had, government to business to labor to not-for-profits, and uh, also, of course, with the federal, our federal partners and municipal partners as well. I'm very proud of the work that all of us of British Columbians have done to get to where we are, but uh, a few more days yet. And I'll ask Mel to go into the details about her discussions with the tourism sector. 
Great, thanks for the question. Yeah, Restruck, uh, a tourism advisory table. Um, Dr. Bonnie Henry has attended uh, four of the four meetings uh, to hear firsthand what the concerns are so that, of course, the PHO is alive to the issues, that government's alive to the issues and the solutions and the calls to action. Right now, we're striking uh, working groups. Uh, that's a plan moving forward to drill down because not all of the sectors are the same. They're not all um, equally impacted by um, the pandemic, but the tourism advisory table is giving us that advice. Uh, we're working closely with them in tandem, you know, cabinet, the senior officials are all working around the clock so that we've got good news to come shortly, but they are at the table because we need them to tell us uh, what they need for the immediate and medium and then long-term um, as we move through this pandemic. Thank you. Katie, do you have a follow-up? Yes. And what, what about the, the restaurants in terms of indoor dining? Will they be able to reopen after the May long weekend? Are they be, being given sort of a heads up so that they can get the necessary supply and um, a higher back staff if needed? Like what's the uh, plan for indoor dining? Uh, well, again, uh, Katie, uh, the, all of those plans will be laid out next week, uh, but be assured that we are in, in discussion with the, the uh, hospitality sector, have been for a long, long time, and uh, we will give as much notice as we can. Uh, I want people to understand, though, that we are not out of this yet. The circuit breaker remains in place until next week, and people need to adhere to that. We are so close, uh, and we need to just keep going for a little bit longer. I'll also add to your question, uh, because Melanie has a, a unique distinction uh, at the cabinet table uh, overseeing tourism, which has been struggling, but also film, which was one of the first industries in British Columbia to put in place safe operating practices. And we have seen record numbers of uh, television and film uh, sets uh, in British Columbia since the pandemic began. And that's a testimony to uh, the hard work of the sector to make sure they had plans in place. And we have tried uh, almost in every sector. Uh, tourism is the big challenge is no people. If you're not having people come, you're going to have difficulty having people go through the turnstiles, as Jonathan said about H.R. McMillan. But when it comes to other sectors that Melanie has been working with, we've been finding safe ways to operate that have continued to keep people employed and to continue to keep people focused and active on getting out of COVID-19 and back to better days in the months ahead. Richard Zussman, Global News. I'm just wondering, Premier, whether there'll be any eligibility requirements here for organizations that already have received substantial grants. Uh, you mentioned some of the provincial grants or federal grants, where are there some anchor attractions like the PNE who have received almost no financial support? So is that weighed in here? And are you unfairly putting the burden of the PNE all on the shoulders of the city of Vancouver, which doesn't have the same sort of access to funds as your government does. Well, I don't think we're doing anything unfairly. Uh, the city has res primary responsibility for the PNE, not the province. Uh, and uh, the PNE could have applied, uh, I'm confident, for uh, some of the federal programs if they, if they had chose to do so. Uh, we're confident that this program is available to them. We're excited about that. And we're going to, of course, continue working with the PNE, uh, the board and, and others at the city to make sure that it can come back better than ever. Uh, in the in the year ahead, and that's our that's our commitment. But we have a whole bunch of other uh, balls in the air, as I've said, and and uh, we're comfortable that this is going to land well for the vast majority of the major attractions in BC. Follow up, Richard. There's a conversation being had about the future of the Oakland A's, and one of the locations that Major League Baseball is potentially looking at is Vancouver. Would you be supportive of a province? of a Major League Baseball team uh, moving to British Columbia? 100%. Uh, I was ecstatic, ecstatic to work with the uh, Canadians, uh, uh, Vancouver Canadians, when there was uh, the prospect of them potentially moving out of Vancouver. Uh, I spoke with management and ownership, in fact, at that time and was delighted to see uh, the Seas stay in Vancouver. Now, of course, we need to address a whole bunch of other issues before we get a ball thrown uh, and a bat swung. But uh, if there was a prospect of bringing... Uh, uh, MLB to Vancouver, I would be right behind that. And so I know uh, Minister Mark would be very enthusiastic as well. Tanya Fletcher, CBC. Yeah, Premier, the hospitality sector has been desperate for a restart plan. You kind of talked about it a bit uh, earlier, but, you know, Dr. Henry hasn't ruled out extending the current restrictions past May 25th. So what do you say to hotel operators specifically, wondering if, you know, the peak summer season might be a write-off for them if, if non-essential um, travel among the regions remains in place 
beyond this long weekend. Yeah, I certainly understand the challenges, uh, Tanya, and thank you very much for the question. But I also know that the vast majority of British Columbians support keeping our borders closed. They support uh, non-essential travel being restricted until such time as we see uh, the impact on our hospitals, for example. Our frontline workers, our, our healthcare workers have been stressed to the max over the past 15 months, and we do not want to see a spike in cases that will lead to an increase in hospitalizations. And that's why Dr. Henry has put in place, a, a, I believe, a thoughtful plan, and she has talked, as Melanie said, uh, to the sector uh, repeatedly about what the challenges are and what are the metrics that we'll be looking for, and we'll be laying that out in more detail next week, and the industry knows that. Tanya, do you have a follow-up? Yeah, I believe in question period, Minister Mark had said that you will be meeting with Alaskan senators in the coming days. But a few moments ago, you gave no indication that would be happening, only suggesting that you had early communication with them or from them. So can you clarify whether you will be having new discussions within this week and what those might entail as well? We have made, my office has made requests uh, for meetings with both Senator Sullivan and Murkowski, and we haven't settled a date yet. Uh, I know I'm meeting with uh, Governor Inslee later uh, this week, uh, and I didn't want to announce a meeting that has not yet been set. But the, the overture has been made, the letters, the correspondence has been going back and forth. I have to say both senators have been very proactive about this. They understand the positive relationship between Alaska and British Columbia. They don't want to diminish that in any way, but they want to stand up for their sector, and I absolutely support that. Next question is from Lisa Yusta, News 1130. Hi, Premier. Following up on what some other people have, have asked, you're saying that when you get these applications in, you will look at what companies or what attractions need, aquarium, science world, different places. A million dollars is not enough for many of these. So what can or will be done to bolster that, considering that this summer is looking a lot like last summer, meaning people aren't going to have the tourism that they had previously? Well, I, I'm more optimistic about the summer uh, than you, I guess. Uh, I, I've seen 56% uh, of British Columbians uh, who are eligible get a first dose. Uh, I've seen an, uh, almost an endless supply and now being provided by the federal government, which, of course, we would have all loved to have seen in uh, January and February, but it's here today. Uh, we've seen a decline in case counts. The seven-day rolling averages are very positive. Uh, the impact on hospitalizations and acute care is very positive. So I'm optimistic that uh, come the summer, we're going to be uh, having full mobility. But right now, I don't want people to hear Oregon say, let's go out and party, because that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying we have all done a great deal to get here, and we'll have more to say next week. Lisa, do you have a follow-up? I do, because full mobility here in the province, even in Canada, still will see hotel operators, attractions, bus drivers, all of these locations, whether big cities or rural, probably worse in rural areas, not bringing in the money they had last, you know, two years ago. So will there be more money available if they're seeing the same kind of hard hit summer, even a, you know, even a bit better than last summer? Will there be more money available for these businesses, these tourism-based businesses? Well, again, uh, I, I put a lot of uh, emphasis on our vaccine program uh, and immunization, not just in Canada and North America, but indeed around the world. Uh, we are uh, not going to be leaving COVID behind on uh, July 1st. It will be with us for the foreseeable future. What will change is how we manage that risk. And those, are, uh, those risks are better managed by having a, a fully immunized community uh, that can welcome others from around the world who are in a similar position. There are a lot of hoops to go through yet, a lot of discussions with the federal government and, and uh, international partners for that matter. And I'm optimistic that we're going to have a much better summer than this year than we did last year. But I don't want anyone to be under the illusion that we're going to flick a switch or snap our fingers and all of a sudden we're back to what we were at because that's not going to happen. But we are in a good place and we have committed from the beginning of this pandemic that the province will be there for people, for businesses and for communities as long as we have to. But I don't want to predict the day we announce a $50 million grant program where the gaps are going to be two weeks from now. When they make themselves clear, we'll deal with them at that time. What I do know is that we consulted widely 
on this program. We took direction and advice from the sector and we put this in place and it's going to be well received. Will we be done now? I don't believe so, but this is a good start. Amy Smart, Canadian Press. Hi there, I'm wondering if you can give a ballpark figure on how many um, anchor uh, attractions are eligible for this or would be sharing the funds. Go ahead, Mel. So some of our numbers, of our numbers suggest that there could be up to 40 for the, sorry, for the rural, up to about 40. In Vancouver, the more urban, maybe 30. Um, this is, with all due respect, new terrain for government to be handing out grants um, to a sector. And, you know, part of the call to action is because we're in the middle of the this global pandemic. But examples could be Museum of Anthropology, Bouchard Gardens, Capilano Suspension Bridge, p e Science World, Wildlife Places, attractions that have, as the Premier mentioned, that kind of landmark quality, it's immovable. Uh, and those tour operators are also going to be essential to mobilize and move folks between destinations, uh, which is why we've included them, because they're the lifeline uh, to get visitors to, to these attraction sites. Um, the reason why we've, we've opened the window uh, to, to June 7th is we know that we need to get the money out the door, which is why we want people to apply as soon as possible, assess uh, what their needs are and get, get the checks out the door so that we, we have these destinations of choice and those anchors available um, post pandemic for years to come. Thank you. Amy, do you have a follow up? Yeah, thanks. I mean, we, we've talked about the PNE, but um, more broadly speaking, do you, do you genuinely believe this is enough money to prevent any of these anchors from going under? Y yes, uh, yes, yes, I do. I, I, sorry, yeah, 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 I think both of us would answer the affirmative. And, and again, this, this is, uh, we have been developing programs for the past 15 months that didn't exist in BC before, didn't exist at the federal level before. This is uncharted territory every time we make a new announcement. And every time we do, we better refine the criteria to make sure we can get the money out quickly. And Melanie and her team have worked very closely with the tourism sector to make sure that we've got all of this covered and corralled. And $50 million will be significant uh, as we go into uh, the summer of 2021. And if there's more to do, we're certainly open to that discussion. And I don't know if Mel, you want to add to that? Yeah, I mean, I think I think this. I think there was an earlier question, maybe by Lisa. This is along uh, a menu. Um, there are a number of of grants that we put out the door. Uh, the sector has asked for grants, not loans, so people don't have to pay it back. Uh, there is also funds that have come uh, from the federal government in their 2021 budget, which are very promising, and we are going to be advocating that BC gets its share uh, for events and festivals. So I, I think this will help, um, and we're we're alive to being at the table with the sector to understand what the needs are as we move our way through the, the pandemic. Thank you. We have time for one more question. That comes from Rob Buffum, CTV Vancouver Island. Oh, thank you for taking my question. I guess I wanted to confirm that this $50 million is not new money. It's money that was announced back in the budget last month. And I also wanted to get your reaction um, to concerns from, it's been raised earlier, but concerns from tourism industry folks who say we really need a plan because wholesalers are trying to figure out the year 2022 plans and the tourism industry doesn't have a plan yet that they can pass on. What's your reaction to that? Well, I can tell you that I was on a website yesterday looking uh, to see how easy it was to get a flight anywhere. And every time I put in Vancouver to anywhere, they said cannot sell. So this is not about BC. This is about the world. We're in a global pandemic. We are a better place than many because of the hard work of British Columbians to get to a place where we can have more travel, we can have more economic activity. And the other bit of good news is that the pent up desire of British Columbians to go and see their friends, to go to places that they always meant to go to, but the past year they've been barred from going to, means that I believe that come this summer, there is going to be a lot of people moving around, seeing things they've never seen before, spending that discretionary dollars that they do have in their pocket to stimulate and boost activity right across BC. And I'm excited about that. But to suggest, and I know you weren't suggesting in your question, but to suggest that BC is isolated in this case is just not true. The challenge we have is that the world is gripped by this. And we've seen uh, uh, on the nightly news, different jurisdictions uh, having different reopening strategies. 
all of them tied to vaccinations. I know the UK, my, my eldest son lives in London, England, and the freedoms that he has to move around had been severely restricted for a long, long period of time. But he and his uh, spouse are going traveling next week. They're really excited about it. A and that's because of the vaccination program in the UK. As we continue with our vaccination program here, unprecedented in its success, in my opinion, uh, we'll be in a better position to not just plan for, for 2022, but I think get a good kickstart on 2021. Rob, do you have a follow-up? I do. It's on behalf of a colleague who's doing a story about legions in BC who are upset that they haven't uh, received funding from the province in relation to the circuit breaker grants. Um, what's your response, Premier, to legions who are upset that they haven't got funding during this tough pandemic time? And might there be any financial funding coming their way? Well, there have been uh, opportunities for legions to apply for a range of uh, of programs over the past year, whether it be uh, assistance with rent, assistance with uh, uh, wage subsidies, uh, if they're rehiring after a protracted closure, the, the province will help there. The federal government has helped as well. But the circuit breaker was designed for for-profit businesses. And regrettably, the Legion, which I support 100%, uh, just got my renewal uh, paid and in the mail yesterday. Uh, I believe that uh, we will have to look with the federal government and with local governments who have uh, an ability to help shape uh, the legions in their community, uh, how we get forward from here. But we all know that uh, this has been a year like no other. And, and I, I look forward every year to Remembrance Day ceremonies in Lankford and in Souk at both of the legions in my community. And I know people across Canada feel the same way. What I can predict without any doubt is that November 11th, 2021, will be a day filled with people re reminding ourselves of the sacrifices others have made for our freedoms and then sharing in those freedoms by going to a cenotaph, going to a legion and supporting those not-for-profits and maybe uh, making a donation beyond uh, the, the usual donations that are given at that time of year. I call on all British Columbians to look to their legions and see what they can do to help them through this difficult time. But the circuit breaker was designed for for-profit businesses. Uh, we're gonna continue to look at ways to help the Legion. But again, I, I appeal to everyone in their communities to recognize and acknowledge the great work that's done by our Legions, mostly volunteer work, and, and go in and do what you can to help out. That's all the time we have. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Melanie. Thanks, Jonathan.